Hello ladies and gentlemen, in my previous video I said I was planning on doing a series of editorials and when thinking of topics, it was then that I realized how this year I don't have any plans to review MGS4 and onward. By the way, I know I said in my Portable Ops review that I would, but this was a massive scripting and planning oversight since I literally have no time for any of those games this year. But during the Slide 2 LP and other videos, I realized how a lot of people were requesting MGS4, which I totally get. I have always loved reviewing this series, and it seems people enjoy watching it too. Which is why next year we're going to do MGS4, and I will try to do Peace Walker, the MGS5 games, and yes, Metal Gear Rising, which I only picked up after the Portable Ops review dropped. So yeah, the next three editorials are going to be focused on the Metal Gear series just to hold you guys over till next year. Today, we're going to go back to the very beginning of the series to do yet another revisit in the same vein as the Maverick Hunter X video from a few months ago. The MGS retrospective started way back in 2016 with my videos on the MSX games. In both of those videos, I had claimed I was reviewing both the MSX and NES games, but in the final product, it was just me ranting about the opening minutes of the NES games. I can tell you now, my opinions are probably going to be the same by the end of this, but I'll try to give them a real review at the same time. I'm sure you won't know the story. Metal Gear was a fantastic game for the MSX in the year 1987, with Konami being very impressed with the team's work, so a port to the NES was planned for localization purposes since the MSX was not a viable platform in America since the NES was the very definition of gaming back in the 80s. In the NES era, games obviously had minimal stories with much of the context provided in the manual, so this meant that English translators could often barf out whatever they thought a story could be for the game as opposed to following the ideas that the developers had intended. Metal Gear on MSX is a bit different than your average 8-bit game, though. Within the game, there was a story as Solid Snake grew from inexperienced to a war hero by the end. The betrayal of Big Boss, the intro of Gray Fox, and the destruction of the first Metal Gear... Oh, that's not the first Metal Gear. Oh, wait. It's the fifth. Gotta love them retcons! Anyway, the in-game story isn't too different from the MSX version. The small amount of differences that are there do make a difference, though. Point is... Solid Snake works for Foxhound and is sent in to destroy the final weapon, Metal Gear, since Gray Fox went missing during his assignment to Outer Heaven. Snake is led by Big Boss and a few other people over the radio that don't really have an impact on this story or any other game in this series. Well, except maybe Kyle Schneider, but that's about it. Big Boss is really the villain, Snake destroys Metal Gear. The end. Of course, this is the non-canon telling of this story, which starts at the very beginning with the infamous opening cutscene depicting four soldiers dropping from a plane into the woods. Kinda reminds me of the Halo jump from Snake Eater. But who the hell are these other three? I have no idea, they are just plainly never mentioned again. I mean, Gray Fox disappears from the story in the original as soon as you save him, but he was set up as the target and once you saved him, his role was finished. This is just the kind of inept storytelling that happened way back then. It's a serious strike against this game and technically it hasn't even started yet. Once it does, the transceiver appears and looks a lot less interesting than before, but this isn't even close to the problem. As soon as you start to read the dialogue, a glaring issue that plagued the 20th century of video games rears its ugly head. The translation is absolutely atrocious. You are to infiltrate the enemy fortress, Outer Heaven, then destroy their final weapon, Metal Gear. First, attempt to contact missing R. Gray Fox. Then, try to find the Metal Gear. It doesn't get much better from this point on with the I feel asleep guy and the uh oh the truck have started to move. I prefaced how this was a massive issue in gaming's formative years, so as a result, I get that Metal Gear on NES is not alone with this, it just makes playing it in 2018 far worse than the MSX version, which is also an unfair comparison, since there did exist an English translation of Metal Gear 1 for European gamers on the MSX long before Snake Eater Subsistence, and this translation was not much better than the NES one. However, this isn't even for our region. We Americans have an NES copy and the MSX translation from Snake Eater Subsistence in 2006 that was also used in the HD and Legacy collections. This also goes to show how the exact same story can be told in two different versions of the same game, but one is a simple, albeit interesting story that checks off all the boxes on how to tell a great tale, even with limited hardware, while the other is often an incoherent mess that I can barely read. The manual also has literally no idea what's going on in this game. Metal Gear 1 was an espionage mission in the newly formed Outer Heaven, but the story itself wasn't very political. I cited Metal Gear 2 as the beginning of that, since the game was set in the midst of a Cold War crisis, talks of World War 2, NATO, and so on, with MGS 1 through 3 all revolving around some kind of government conspiracy, like the spread of Fox Die in MGS 1, the Patriots in MGS 2, and the death of the boss in MGS 3. 
But as silly as it may be, Metal Gear 1 NES's marketing was trying to be semi-political. The back of the box states that we must stop the crazed Colonel Vermin Gaddafi, who poses a new terrorist threat to the world. A play on the Libyan Colonel Gaddafi, with some other noise about being led by Commander South, even though the game still says Big Boss. That basically covers the story of MGNES. It butchers what was once a great story, and is thrown out of canon rather quickly. The opening jungle level is quite infamous for how poor the level design is. Speaking of level design, most of it is directly lifted from the MSX game, but similar to the story, there are the tiny details that kill it. The stuff that is new, like these jungles, are just absolutely atrocious. The area is poorly designed for many reasons that affect the whole game, but it contains elements that are so unlike the original game. Like this maze area, which is more like the Zelda 1 overworld other than one big dungeon, which was the design philosophy from MG1 to MGS2. It's hard to tell what you can and can't sneak past, like these cars with plenty of space in between you and the trees. You can't go through that perfectly logical space and sneak past the dogs, but you instead have to get caught here. It's also possible to get in the wrong truck and be taken to some completely random point in the game. It's just too damn early to introduce ideas like this. By comparison, Metal Gear 1's opening was so well designed. You'd naturally walk in the way of the gas mask, but the door is locked so you know you might need a key. Go the other way and you find the first card key. Go back and the mask is yours. It has such a fine flow to it. Once you get inside, there are double the pitfalls, double the bad enemy placements, and so on. This is such an insignificant change, but it has such a major impact. Take this room for example. The back of these trucks always faced the south of the screen before, and this enemy to avoid was always in the northern part of the screen. Very natural to avoid. However here, the trucks are flipped so that they face the north, and you have to get the grenades and the handgun here, but the guard has not been changed, meaning that you will automatically be caught here without fail every time, and this can lead to your ultimate demise. Guards are easy to deal with in MG1 still, but the difference in design is just so telling. The biggest sin against this game makes everything I've said ten times worse. The checkpoint system. In the OG Metal Gear, the star system was a nuisance since your ammo totals were linked to your stars. On normal mode, anything less than 4 out of 4 stars just isn't enough to beat Metal Gear in the end. The star system is here as well and is much, much worse. Dying with one star, whether it be a pitfall or some shit you couldn't see coming, sends you back to the start of the game and not the room you died in like the first game. Yes, in the first Metal Gear game, saving brought you back to these elevators, but you still came back to the room you died in, or at least the floor. Two stars in MGNES is the start of building one, which means that making progress can be painfully cut short in an instant. And it is painful. Combined with the fact that I just don't think this game handles very well, the very clumsy menu, as you have to hit select to access one of the three options, weapons, items, and transceiver, with the game changing its mind as to which buttons do what, and so on. All for what? The final boss in the game isn't even the titular Metal Gear. We destroy this supercomputer that destroys Metal Gear from off screen. Why this is lame should be quite evident. Metal Gear TX-55 couldn't even move without a pilot, but it was still there, it was climactic. That was a lot of negativity in pretty rapid succession, so what do I like, actually? The soundtrack is actually pretty good stuff. Some pieces from the original Metal Gear make a comeback, like the battle against TX-55, the return of Foxhounder in the credits. Most pieces like the jungle theme or the infiltration theme are all new, and I can really get down with it. The graphics are okay, it's quite colorful which is nice, although there's less frames of animation in the MSX games, and there's less visual variety, but it's easy on the eyes than a lot of NES games. That pretty much sums up my thoughts on Metal Gear NES. While I do hate this game, a lot of its flaws are very understandable. The translation was shoddy, but that was almost every game back then. 
The menus are awkward and unintuitive, however this is a product of being a game that has been played with four buttons, one of which has to pause the game. Some of the other nonsense like the checkpoints and the level design is just inept from a developer standpoint. One of the things I said in my original look at this game was the fact that the MSX game told you you couldn't carry any more rations, but the NES game doesn't do this at all except for looking into the menu which is already a pain in the ass to get to. I have since been told that this was yet another addition from the Snake Eater Subsistence version, and to that I say, it doesn't really matter. The 2006 MG1 really benefits from being released in 2006 since we have an actually good translation and an update to the feel of some of the mechanics to make it more presentable. But I just say it adds more reason to never play the NES version. It's a product of its time, but in 2018 there really is only one version of Metal Gear 1 I can recommend and only one version I want to see in these Metal Gear timeline videos. Seriously, can people stop using NES footage for Metal Gear 1 in a timeline video? Not only is this version not canon, but they literally play MG2 on the HD collection. The MSX MG1 is but a click away. Regardless of the time-based advantage that the HD MG1 MSX has, it's still by far the better game. This didn't stop the game from selling a bazillion copies on NES, and that can only mean one thing. Obviously, the NES team did a good job, and so should do a North American sequel. And this is how we got... Snake's Revenge. A title lacking logic since Snake was victorious now to heaven and Big Boss was just some random guy who was evil at this point and not Naked Snake, so anyway, America has found out that an enemy nation has plans for the destroyed Metal Gear that got destroyed off camera in the NES game and are now constructing Metal Gear 2. Not the game, a mech called Metal Gear 2. You know, I feel like I've made that exact joke at some point. Lieutenant Solid Snake has been selected for this mission titled Operation 747, and he should be accompanied by John Turner, a former Navy member, and Nick Meyer, an explosives and weapons expert. The story in Snake's Revenge isn't actually half bad. It's not canon in the Metal Gear series, but that doesn't make it bad by default, because there are a few twists and turns throughout, and we actually do get to see Metal Gear this time around. So there is a definite improvement in that regard. At the end, it's revealed that Big Boss is now a robot. Huh. So this was the first outlandish plot twist in the series. The text is also far more readable. The scrolling speed is a bit slow, but that's just more nitpicking. The back of the box is once again a pile of schwarbage as Colonel Vermin Katafi went psycho. Unfortunately, your two best friends took the brunt of his frenzy and lost their fight to live. As nutty as ever, Katafi has sought asylum from the world's premier bad guy, Haya Rola Kakamani. Grateful to this Rola Radical, the Colonel has donated the biggest, baddest, ultra-chic nuclear attack tank to his fellow madman's world domination cause. Like, this is literally not the story of the game! I don't know how they got away with just so casually pooping out whatever and putting it on the back of the box. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm sorry. I overheard that story explanation from across the country, and that's ridiculous. You can't just stop there. This needs anal cysts. Haven't I had enough of you crashing my videos, TGX? Yes, but I'd also never want to miss an opportunity to make fun of something like this. So let's see. First of all, I know you already mentioned Colonel Katafi, but that honestly sounds like something you'd buy at a candy shop. Hey, can I get the saltwater Katafi? Then the next line, your two best friends, who they were isn't specified, but they lost their fight to live. What? That has to be the dumbest way to put it I've ever heard. So what, a physical manifestation of life itself came to life and fought these guys and they lost? That's what the phrasing sounds like. How about they just died? Nutty as ever? That is the least sophisticated way you could have put it. Plus, they already mentioned he's crazy in the first line. Bad guy is the most juvenile way to put it, villain or evil mastermind is better for a dignified sounding term for an antagonist, but then high roll a cockamamie? I don't have adequate words to describe how fucking stupid that sounds. Hi, Rola Kakamami. Well, it certainly is Kakamami to have a fucking name like that. It's less a name, more a Mad Lib. Biggest? Baddest? Was this written by a five-year-old? Ultra Chic Nuclear Missile. So what, it's a fashionable accessory? Get the new Ultra Chic Nuclear Missile, available in all the best fall colors. Jesus H. Christ on a stick. That started off bad and got worse with every word. By the end, it ceased to sound like a description and more like the ramblings of a madman. I haven't seen writing and phrasing this bad since I read The Eye of Argon. Furthermore, I- Okay, I've let you speak long enough, to get out of here. Before even thinking about the gameplay, let's talk about the non-gameplay elements. Firstly, the graphics have seen some improvement over Metal Gear NES, with far more variety in the different levels, with the game also doing a good job of differing set pieces like underground mines, forests, bases, trains, and battleships. The soundtrack is also not bad. I don't think this is the best the 8-bit Metal Gear games have and can do, but it certainly is good stuff.
My take on this game will probably be shorter than Metal Gear 1, since Snake's Revenge makes a lot of improvements, like how the checkpoint system is nowhere near as obnoxious as it was back in MG1 NES. Certain features like non-lethal kills giving you ammo are back from MG1 MSX. Beyond that, the controls still work pretty well, with the obvious exception of the menu, since it's just as unintuitive as it was before. I can understand why, but I would still rather not play it. I wanted this review to be different from my last, but seriously guys, this game broke me. When I played Snake's Revenge back in 2016 for the review, I thought it was painful since the opening area is one of the worst in MGS history. The opening area of the first NES game is infamous enough, but this one is 10 times worse with these spotlights running around where I can't see where I am, I don't know where I'm going. So many pathways where you just get caught over and over as the guards just spot me with no idea as to what I did wrong, bullets don't go across the whole screen, I keep needing to recollect the same power-ups upon death, you name it. This is just the traditional gameplay at the beginning of the game, I might add. It is physically excruciating. I can live with that, though. You can power through terrible 2D Metal Gear gameplay as the NES game has proven. But the reason I just dropped Snake's Revenge right away was this goddamn 2D section. The first of many, but this one was so frustrating that I just quit since detection is almost unavoidable, damage is also almost unavoidable as the enemies have more mobility than you do, which is a major no for me in game design. Since the first three areas were just plain maddening, guess what? I stopped playing. Folks, what is my policy? It was in Size Matters and Secret Agent Clank and it went something like this. If I'm having such a bad time that I feel like I literally cannot go on, I won't. In this game, I kept dying for reasons that I really didn't flick were my fault. I just wanted to stop playing and pick up the MSX games, or any other MGS game for that matter. I posed the question in my first take on this game, is Snake's Revenge better or worse than the NES original, and I've reached the answer. I would probably rather play the first game. I set this up just a minute ago. You can power through the NES Metal Gear 1 since it is bad, but it's a bad version of a good game. Snake's Revenge is its own original turd, and this could be to its benefit, but really it's only to its detriment since the design we did get was just... trash. But what's funny about these games is that it really was a massive domino effect that got us to MGS1. MG1 and MSX was a great game that impressed many back in 87, and so a Western NES port was made. It was such a success that we got a Western sequel, but Kojima learned of this NES sequel on the bus one morning, and that's when he got the idea for an Asian-exclusive MSX sequel that wouldn't reach the West until 2006 alongside the true MG1. So when MGS1 was made, the decision was made to remix many elements from MG2. So we kind of owe thanks to the NES games for propping this series up to be in the position to get games like MGS1, 2, or 3. And that's all the time we have for today, folks. I now feel satisfied with my takes on the NES Metal Gear games like I was after the Maverick Hunter X revisit. The next time I see you all fine folks will be in a few weeks when the Mega Man X Legacy collections are given to us. I'm very excited for that and I hope you all are too. In the Metal Gear universe, I'm going to be talking about the optional difficulty modes in the MGS games, so stay tuned for that. Thank you all for watching and I will see you next time.